Shekong. Welcome, everyone. My name is Siwu Aguilar Itso. And my name is Blake Clavia. We would like to welcome you to the fourth event of the North Country Art, Land and Environment Summit. The topic of this panel is the environmental future of the St. Lawrence River watershed. On behalf of the North Country Art, Land and Environment Summit, we wanted to thank all our collaborating partners, the people, the, uh, the organizations, and the land and the water that have made this summit possible. The program was funded by Humanities New York with the support of the National Endowment of the Humanities, the St. Lawrence University Art Collaborative Grant, and the Richard F. Brush Art Gallery. We would also like to thank the North Country Public Radio for being our media sponsor and the Weave News for hosting the event tonight. This special panel is happening in tandem with Water and Origin, honoring the first Storyteller exhibition and the Grass Talk virtual exhibition. And finally, we will pass you to your moderator, Stephen Bird, who will introduce the panel and give the land acknowledgement. Hello, everybody. My name is Stephen Bird, um, and I'm a professor at Clarkson University, uh, and I do a lot of work in environmental policy. Uh, and I have lived my entire life uh, within five hours of the St. Lawrence River, more than half of it within an hour of the St. Lawrence River in Montreal, Ottawa, uh, now in Potsdam. Uh, and uh, I'm extremely honored uh, to be uh, starting this presentation. I'd like to begin uh, with a land acknowledgement and to acknowledge that the land upon which we gather here is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee peoples, and especially the Kanyakahaka, the Mohawk. Um, in addition, those of us who are part of this colonial society acknowledge our role as settlers on this territory, honoring those who have stewarded this land since time began. Um, and so we have a panel tonight with an, a really nice and, and uh, uh, set of presenters who have an enormous range of perspectives and background to bring to us as we start to think about the environmental future of the St. Lawrence River watershed. And I'm not gonna spend too much time, but this amazing water system is one of two uh, that go deep into the heart of North America. Um, it's incredible importance um, as an ecosystem, as a watershed, uh, as a movement, as a traveling component, um, and as home to uh, trillions of different beings um, is, is incredibly important. So um, with that, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time. Uh, we have five presenters tonight, and the way we're gonna do this is uh, they each have uh, a presentation that will run five to eight minutes. And then um, we will open it up to discussion and questions. Uh, and we will ask people, I, I believe, Sinzun, that we will be opening it up uh, for people to either put in questions on chat uh, or to raise a hand. But I'm not sure I may be corrected on that. I realized I forgot to ask that. They, they will be putting it on through chat. Yes. Thank you. OK, yep. That's, that's what I thought, but I couldn't quite remember. Anyway, uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna uh, uh, present uh, Tom Langen, who's Interim Dean of Arts and Sciences uh, and Professor of Biology at Clarkson University um, and an avid birder. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm honored to be on this panel of the environmental, on the environmental future of the St. Lawrence watershed with this outstanding group of an environmental and community leaders from our precious region. I'd like to thank Blake and Tinsun for organizing the North Country Art, Land and Environment Summit. I hope all of you have had a chance to participate in the other panels. And I wanna thank all of the beings that make up our environment and the Haudenosaunee people and all people who've protected it, stewarded it and found ways on, to, on how to live in harmony in ways that we can all learn from. My name is Tom Langen. I'm the Dean of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Biology at Clarkson University. I'm a board member of local organizations that are dedicated to the community 
um, including Grass River, Grass River Heritage, the St. Lawrence Land Trust, Adirondack to Algonquin Collaborative, and Northern New York Audubon. I've lived in the region about 21 years, but my wife was raised here, and this is the only home my children know. For my brief remarks, I want to talk a little bit about the St. Lawrence River watershed, how it's changing, how the environment is changing, and how our community, all of us, are doing things that are helping our communities and the environment reduce the harm of change and make our region more resilient to it. So here I'm showing some images of our region. And you can see it's a place where multiple nations meet. It's a place where water and land meet and they mix together, they interdigitate. The health of our communities depend on healthy waters and healthy land and healthy communities. The three can't be separated. They depend on one another. And the three are changing as we go into the third decade of the 21st century. So the region is one that's, if I can manage the technology, it's one that a region that has experienced a lot of change. Environmental change is not new. I have a picture here of a beaver. Beaver is sort of the ecological ecosystem engineer, creates wetlands. We have more beaver than anywhere in the world in the St. Lawrence Valley. Most of many of our wetlands have been created by the actions of beaver. But 150 years ago, they were gone. Beaver were important for thousands of years and then disappeared from our environment because they were they were over they were trapped out and then they returned this area was very different 13,000 years ago it was under ice the ice melted land changed plants and animals returned land use has changed over the years human communities have gone come and gone or changed in new ways we've had losses and gain of species so we live in a region that is uh, resilient to change and has experienced lots of change. But it's continuing to change and in some ways it concern us all, I believe. Here's an image of forest cover in our region in green. The areas in red are areas that were recently deforested. Now some of those recently deforested areas are areas that are under commercial timber harvesting, uh, forest management, and probably something that's desirable, a, a desirable land use. But there's also other deforestation that's going on that might be concerning. So here is a local area with Waddington, Coles Creek, and you can see all of these pink areas are areas that were recently deforested. Blue areas are areas that recently reforested. And you can see that there's a lot more forest loss than gain in our area. And many of those are very close to our watersheds. Um, we're seeing changes in our forests because of pathogens and pests like emerald ash borer, uh, beech bark disease, and many others. It also can affect our fisheries, new pathogens that affect the health of fish, and with um, other things that affect our fisheries and the quality of our waters, including dams, changes in agricultural practices, harmful chemicals produced by industry and some agricultural practices, and changes in human movements and human occupancy in our area. We live in an area where um, this change is ongoing, but it's it's really important. I think one of the things that we we kind of understand, but it's sometimes we need to be reminded is we're really in a crossroads. We're really in a very important area. So I have a photo, uh, an image here of the Adirondack Park, the Algonquin Park, and the area in between, including our area. It's an area of forest and continuous movement. We can see it's an area here. In red are areas that are strongly impacted by people, yellow somewhat, green uh, less so. And we can see that we're in an area where there's a lot of intact landscape. We have lots of, of healthy waters, but we also have impacts that affect our area. Moreover, we're in an area that is a crossroads with climate change, with the changes that are happening to our environment, we live in a very important place for North America. So we live in an area where as climate warms and um, climate patterns change, southerly species will move north, northerly species will move further, further north. And the area where there is habitat and waters in which there's connectivity in which those movements to occur are precisely in our area. 
we are a crossroads in North America, a very important one. Um, we are also in an area that is blessed with plenty of water. Water provides, and, and waters, rivers, wetlands, marshes, fens, swamps, they provide ecosystem services that benefit us and benefit our environment. We're blessed with an abundance of wetlands and water waterways, an abundance of ecosystem services, ones that um, people around North America um, will envy and need in the future. So with these changes, we can, we, can, we can focus on the negative, but we also can think about, and I just wanna talk about briefly the positive. So for example, we're working on improving aquatic connectivity. Here is, there's many projects now looking at increasing stream connectivity by rebuilding roads and making passageways that will allow water to flow. Dam removal, here is a removal of a dam in, um, at Aquasasne on the St. Regis River that are providing connectivity. Um, and we have Tony David, who I believe is involved in this project. Um, here's the pa fish passage on, uh, in the Oswagachi River, all ways that we're returning connectivity. Here are a, a series of wetland restorations. All the blue dots, the orange and green dots are places where people have partnered with different agencies to return wetlands onto their property in order to increase the wetland coverage in our area and to provide ecosystem services. Over 150 people, landowners, have done this for conservation for their communities. People do conservation easements in our region. There are hundreds of them. And conservation easements are permanent dedicating certain areas for conservation. These are, these are perpetual um, a promises right in the deed to conserve areas for our communities. People are water, acting as watershed stewards, taking action to protect our waters, protecting the areas along our waterways, our lakes, shores, our rivers and streams. People are providing public access on their land or donating their land as, as a landowner in this case did to provide public access. This is a waterfall on the Grass River that was donated for public access. People are doing citizen science and citizen education so that they can monitor our waters, detect problems, detect changes that we can address and understand our, our these changes. One of the things that my research was focused on is why people do conservation in our area. And particularly with conservation easements and wetland restoration. And we were interested in thinking that a lot of people are doing it for tax benefits and other kinds of benefits and incentives that different programs provide. When we talked to people, we found out the real reason they did it was heritage. They love this area, they're concerned about our, this area, and they want to protect the environment in our communities so that their children, grandchildren, and descendants have a healthy environment, the one that they experienced. So I look forward to hearing what the, my fellow panelists have to say, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Leigh Magai, Mag Magawi. Um, she's the project scientist for the River Institute. Um, and uh, I'll let you take it from there, Leah. Thank you. Um, so I just want to start by acknowledging that I'm on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, also known as Six Nations Iroquois Federacy. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here and thank all the generations of people who have continued their responsibilities to Mother Earth since time immemorial. My um, background, this slide is just, the purpose is just to say that I'm not really from here. I am a scientist and I have worked and lived in other parts of the world. I've been living on the St. Lawrence River now for three years. So that's relatively recent compared to many other people on the panels. Um, I am working on a project called the Great River Rapport and we're looking at the health of the St. Lawrence River. So we, the project came out of a question that was asked to our executive director time and again, which was, you know, how healthy is the river? And so the project was, was spawned probably five years ago, and I joined the team two years ago to try and answer that question. And I guess the most important thing that we wanted to do with this project is um, spark interest and create awareness on the importance of how the health of the ecosystem is intrinsically linked 
to the well-being of people who live in it and then provide knowledge on what it was in the past what it is like now and then how we can make it better tomorrow and that how we can make it better tomorrow is really the question that we're here today for the panel to discuss and i will circle back around to that point um, at the end of my slides so the other thing of course is to engage the community um, in environmental issues about the river i just want to make a note that the project is ecological in nature the framework is the haudenosaunee thanksgiving address and the idea is that we would be weaving scientific indicators with stories from the community um, the inspiration and framework came from henry lickers um, to frame it in the Ohenta and Galawadakwa. And of course, uh, a key um, point for, the, for framing it this way is to showcase that everything is connected and that everything, including people, um, have a role to play in that connectivity. So the project has been um, founded initially with uh, the Mohawk Council at Akwesasne, and there have been many people at MCA who have helped us, and the four people that are on this slide, Henry Lickers, Peggy Pike Thompson, Megan Mitchell, and Abram Francis, have been really key to um, the engagement we've had with MCA. Back in 2012, we launched the project with a website. We asked the community what they wanted to know. We had a number of workshops. These, this image is from World Wetlands Day in Akwesasne. We held a workshop with community um, up on the north side of the river, and we've had 420 people respond so far to that question. When we got the answers of what the community are concerned about, we took those answers to scientists and we said, here are the concerns of the community. Can you help us come up with indicators that can address those concerns? And we now have 36 indicators that we're working through. So some of the indicators are on land, some are of water, some of plants, invertebrates, fish, and animals. We also have indicators, of course, that address the threats. Um, and uh, some of them listed here uh, um, in relation to contaminants and invasive species. For the project, we also have a Mohawk artist who is providing artwork for the project, um, which is really exciting. Uh, the, the work is beautiful. I can't wait to share more of it. It's from Victoria Ransom. And we also have Stephanie Hildebrand, who's working on the visuals. And that's to try and take the scientific data and turn them into infographics um, so that we can you know, uh, communicate the science easily uh, with the greater community. So yeah, we were excited to have Stephanie for that. And she's also providing us with all the photographic imagery for that project. So we're in sort of phase three of that project and we're trying to get people to share their stories with us. So we'll have stories to wrap those indicators in. And I just wanted to say, we have a lot of people on this project, just um, a small sample really of, of, on this image. Um, you can see in the bottom left, we have Michael and Abe and who are here or t involved today with the panel and Lee Wilbanks, who I know was on a previous panel for this, um, for, for the summit. Um, and there are other scientists, of course, Tom as well included, who have provided us with um, help in selecting the indicators. So it's just been a really big collaborative project. And I guess the reason I bring that project and highlight it tonight is that, you know, we're going through this journey of what was it like in the past? What is it like now? But we want to be able to be thinking about what what is it going to be like in the future? And so I'll finish with just um, talking about a report that came out last year from the UN. And there was a lot of media coverage that, you know, there's a million species threatened on the planet. And they came up with the top five drivers for that being change in land use and sea use, direct exploitation of animals, climate change, pollution, and invasive species. And when I read that, I thought, well, well, you know, is that global crisis a local crisis? And when we went through the responses we'd had, um, and it's actually work done by Mark McDougall um, last year when we had around 250 responses, are the top five drivers the same in our local area? And from those responses, the answer is yes, but the order is different locally. So um, identified by the public, pollution came up as their number one concern, followed by change in land use and then invasive species. Direct exploitation of animals and climate change came in tied at four. So I just wanted to bring that global issue to the local perspective. And something that was not um, focused on in this report in all the media coverage. And at the time when it came out, I must have found it on five or six different news outlets and everyone was 
focusing on the million species and those five threats. But there was another very important part of that UN report, and that was the importance of indigenous communities and local communities with environmental issues. And I'm just going to go through some of the points that they highlighted, which is one quarter of global land areas traditionally owned, managed, used, or occupied by indigenous people. And um, those areas are under increasing pressure, but they decline less rapidly than other areas. And areas where there are these concentrations of indigenous people are projected to experience significant negative effects from the global changes in climate. And so there's um, the next three points are important um, to acknowledge so that the knowledge and understanding of large regions and ecosystems and their desired future development pathways will benefit from the views and perspectives and rights of indigenous people and local communities that nature conservation restoration sustainable use all increase when recognition of the knowledge innovations and practices institutions and values of indigenous people and local communities are taken into account and inclusion and participation in environmental um, governance in, increases quality of life. And so these positive contributions from local communities and indigenous people can be facilitated and they, they do list three things. So acknowledging and recognizing traditional territories, forming partnerships and working with indigenous and local communities, and then fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising from the use co-management arrangements with local communities. So that brought me back to the project and that line that I said, you know, we're trying to look at how can we make it better tomorrow. And I have listened now to the panel discussions over the last month. So I want to say thank you to Tintin and Blake for those discussions. Um, important points are knowing where we came from. So knowing the history and the challenges, understanding the current situation, grappling with future sh scenarios. And then I end on this um, slide with ends up bringing a lot more questions to the panel for discussion hopefully today, but what is the vision and how do we get there? Who is part of that vision? I'm new to the area. How do we, how do we develop a vision that can be inclusive? What does that future look like when we follow indigenous philosophies? And that part gets me really excited. And then how can we support making that a reality? So with that, I just want to acknowledge we have partners of course on this project and I also want to acknowledge, of course, the funders and everyone else on the project and say thank you to Stephanie Hildebrand again for the visuals. Uh, our next presentation uh, is uh, Talking Water, which is a, a, a collaboration between Abraham Francis, who's the environmental science officer at the Mohawk Council of the Akwesasne Environmental Program, and Michael Twiss, uh, my colleague, professor and chair of biology at Clarkson. And uh, unfortunately, Abe is not here today, and, and Mike will explain why uh, as he begins the presentation. Thank you, Stephen, and, uh, and thank you, Blake and Chichun, for the uh, for the opportunity to speak today. Um, <clears throat> Abraham Francis is a, a colleague of mine, and uh, we, we started working together a, a year ago, uh, over a year ago, uh, on this project called Talking Water, and. Uh, when I met Blake and Sitsun, it was interesting because they were called Talking Winds, and I thought, well, that's, <laughs> we're, we're on the same page. Um, unfortunately, um, Abraham let me know this morning that his, his grandmother passed away, and so uh, he's, he's taking time to heal. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is, is speak to you all about uh, this project uh, that we've been working on, and to give you some of my background, I'm a, I'm a Yankee by birth, and I, and I spent most of my time growing up in Canada. I studied in Quebec and did a postdoc down at Woods Hole Geographic Institution. <clears throat> I worked in Toronto at Ryerson University for four years prior to coming to Potsdam to work at Clarkson University, where I'm now the professor of biology and uh, chair of that department. And so I came here in 2002. And so I'm from the outside, and I came here because Clarkson had a good reputation doing Great Lakes research. And so I knew about Clarkson. And I knew that the St. Lawrence River is part of the Great Lakes system, according to this Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909. And so I thought to myself, well, I can, I can work on the St. Lawrence River. Um, and what I've been doing is learning a lot about it. And this is my uh, view of the, this section of the river, which most of us here are, 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 are now from and living in. So we've got this 
um, boundary here. We've got, uh, <clears throat> this is our international boundary between Canada and the United States. So we call this the international section of the St. Lawrence River. Um, and down here though, the boundary splits because there's also the Southern nation uh, of Akwesasne, a Mohawk nation. So it's really a, a tri-national region. And when I first came here, I thought, oh, there's gonna be real differences between Canadians and Americans based on their, you know, on their interests, you know, and their, their, their politics. Um, but the more I looked at it, the more I realized that there's actually a, an East-West separation of, of values that people have and they're outlined here. This one end in the, in the western end, they're, they're, they're really interested in the aesthetic of the region, the property values and, and protection. Whereas on in the region around here, which is near Cornwall, Messina, heavily industrialized because of the, of the dam that was created back in 1958 and the seaway that was put in around the same time. And so the interests there are, of course, they're interested in environmental protection, but first of all, consider with things like contamination, human health, and, and, and getting back to a more pristine environment. And so this is kind of like the view that I've, that I've, that I've had of this region. Now, um, I'm gonna show this next slide here. This is a, a pretty powerful topic um, that I'm gonna share with you all. <clears throat> In 1990s, I had a, um, a young family. We were traveling down to a uh, family reunion in Vermont. And so driving across the the, 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 from Cornwall to Messina in a van. I was driving, it was late at night, and uh, this was during this, uh, this time. And with all the children we had in the van sleeping and, and pregnant mothers and everything like this, I thought this is, I felt, I felt threatened. And then afterwards when I learned more about it, and I was learning more about it in the news, I realized my impact was nowhere near as what was happening to the people in this community. And so um, Lee mentioned earlier uh, Henry Lickers, and Henry Lickers is an elder. He's now a commissioner of the International Joint Commission in Seneca, and he's a resident of, of Akwesasne. And he explained to me this linkage between environmental contamination and um, social unrest. And so these are the details right here, and I'm not as eloquent as someone like Lee Wilbank, so I'm going to sort of just have this text here that you can read over while I, while I speak. <clears throat> and so back in 1987, the United States and Canada uh, designated across the Great Lakes region a number of places called areas of concern, so they're heavily contaminated. And this region here in uh, between Cornwall and Messina, which encompasses Aquasajna, was considered to be one of those regions. And because of that, it had an immediate impact on indigenous harvest of fish for sustenance and for, um, for their own purposes. And so that had an impact on, on the men in the community, according to Henry, uh, many of whom were, were lost their stature as a sense of, of, of providers. And so that coincided with um, a land dispute in Oko, Quebec, another Mohawk community that's downstream. And in that case, this, this land dispute was over um, territory. And so the, what happened was, was that some members of the Mohawk community, some young men uh, rose up and, and, and began to support their, their brothers at Oka. And so what we had was a very harmful situation. Um, there was, and still is, a lot of healing that has to take place. And so that civil unrest uh, from a social injustice because of this colonialism um, is, is kind of similar to what we've been experiencing this year. Okay, uh, social injustices and then some, something that triggers people to, to act. And so there's a disturbance. And Lee mentioned earlier these United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And one of them is peace, justice, and strong institutions. And so if we wanna have a future in this region that's, uh, uh, that's, that's sustainable and it's peaceful, then we have to address the, um, the, the, the inherent injustices that exist. So speaking to the future, this is from the data from the past five years. Uh, population in Aquasasne is estimated growing at 3.6% at, at per year. And that's a, that's a low number uh, because a lot of the Aquasasne uh, live, live off the reservation. In 
St. Lawrence County and Franklin County, it's decreasing. And so the, the, the situation becomes that um, there is ceded territory that Akwesasne has, but they're, they're, they will outgrow their, um, their, their territory for their people. Um, the Brookings Institution did a really interesting report, and this is back in the, uh, almost a decade ago now, talking about how if you, if you, if you remediate the, the pollution across the Great Lakes, including these areas of concern, then what's going to happen is the value of it will, will increase a lot. And so people will be attracted to the Great Lakes region because we are investing in remediation. And so what could happen though is that, or what will happen likely, I believe, is that there will be people coming to this region because of the fact that it's got water, it's got clean water, it's attractive, it'll be relatively safe from contamination, it's near big cities, Montreal, Ottawa, Burlington, it's also near large parks. So it's very attractive. Um, I can see people moving out of California, not in, interested in forest fires anymore, moving to this region because of these kinds of reasons. So how do we then engage with these people when they come to this region and, and explain to them the values of, that we have with respect to water in this area? And so that's where it comes to addressing the um, this Mohawk or Haudenosaunee view of, of interactions between different communities. And this is the, the Swanta. Uh, it's a, it's a, a wampum belt. And on the top, this line here represents the Mohawk, say, and these, this line down below represents the, the Dutch, which, which originally was the, 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 the wampum was an agreement between the Mohawk and the, and the Dutch. And so as you see there, those are parallel lines. And so um, it, 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 cause, it, it makes you understand that, that it's a reflection. And so we are sort of traveling on through time along this river together. And what we're doing is, is, is working and respecting each other's views. And so that's what talking water is about. We started with water um, because my expertise, uh, but it's also uh, a great place to begin conversations about the values of resources, how they can be shared um, in a respectful way. And so when people move to the region and us, our neighbors, everyone in the region, the rights holders, like the Haudenosaunee, uh, stakeholders like ourselves, who are new to the region relatively, um, are able to, to, to share our values. Uh, our next speaker is Tony David. Uh, Tony is the director of the Environment Division for the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe, um, and uh, works also with Abe. Um, and uh, Tony, you're on. Um, and uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, and um, and I'm just I'm, I'm honored to be here and I'm just um, you know it's funny it's interesting uh, federal policy hasn't really kept up with uh, relations with indigenous uh, peoples um, as it as it has in, in Canadian side and it's much more common to hear people acknowledge uh, the tr traditional lands uh, on which they occupy um, very rare to hear that on the on, on the American side so it's um, it's refreshing so thank you for that. Um, and my name is, is Tony David. Um, I'm a Mohawk from Okuzasne. Um I'm a descendant of uh, iron workers. The men in my family were all iron workers. Um, and uh, today is uh, wear orange, uh, orange shirt day in Canada. And I'm, I'm wearing orange just to remember the struggles of my great grandfathers, Jack Terrance and Peter Angus White, who survived the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. So just my, my thoughts are with them today. Um, I'm, uh, I've just, I've been, I'm the director of the tribes and environment division, which is uh, on the American side of the territory. Um, I've been in this position for about a year, but prior to that, I was the program manager of water resources. Uh, I've been working for my tribe for about uh, 16 years or more. And um, my background is, is actually in human health risk analysis. Um, and water resources management. Um, so today I wanted to talk about uh, a project um, that we've been working on for the last seven or, or, or eight years. Um, and then it, it's about anticipating what some of these climate change 
impacts are going to be and not just thinking about it in, in terms of what is is a, as a concept of what happens elsewhere um, on the news we see flooding events in Houston we see forest fires raging on the west coast um, but there are definitely local impacts that are happening that, that we need to prepare for as well um, so that's where this picture comes from this is an ice jam on on the St. Regis River so um, so some of the anticipated impacts and the previous presenters have already touched on a lot of the environmental ones. And so I just want to highlight some of the highlights here. Um, you know, we're going to, we're going to see um, impacts on both ends of the spectrum. So right now, particularly in the Great Lakes, we're stuck, we're stuck in a very uh, wet precipitation cycle with high water levels and high flows in rivers. Um, but we can also in the future anticipate prolonged dry periods with low levels and low flows. Um, we are seeing extreme weather events across the country, uh, both in the United States and Canada. And uh, we're also noticing a shift with our seasons and the conditions that, that uh, are provide the environmental cues. Um, I've seen walleye uh, try to spawn up river in, in, the, in the middle of March um, because there was an 80 degree day. Um, and we've also seen periods over winter in the St. Lawrence with hardly any ice. And, the, the absence of these cues are definitely going to have impacts on uh, the ecology within the watershed. Um, and these threats are really a form of, of stress. Um, it's a form of disturbance, both the habitat, um, but it can also greatly impact ha habitat quality um, by compressing um, these environments uh, from the top and the bottom and um, almost acting as if, uh, as if it's a mechanism for pollution. So what we'll continue to see um, is a more abundance of species that are better acclimated for these extremes. Um, unfortunately, uh, that will come at the expense of a lot of the rare, threatened, and culturally significant species. Um, you may have noticed uh, in the St. Lawrence River, smallmouth bass are doing exceptionally well. Um, that's not necessarily a good indicator for the St. Lawrence. Um, and in fact, the, the poorer the water quality gets in the St. Lawrence, the better the bass are going to do. Um, but we're also seeing a lot of other fish that are struggling, um, lake sturgeon, um, channel perch, uh, in some sections walleye. So um, those are just indicators of, of, this, of, of what's to come. Um, a bit, most of this, my, my presentation is going to be on the human endpoints. And, you know, when we think about the wet cycle that the entire Great Lakes is stuck in at the moment, this really began right around 2000. So here we're looking at 36 month precipitation rates uh, across the you know, um, Great Lakes states. And it's been a strong, strong uptick in very persistent weather, uh, uh, wet, wet, wet weather. So all of this water has to go somewhere. Um, we've also seen a varying um, uh, winter conditions. Uh, we're heading into a La Nina year, um, expected to be cold and wet. Uh, El Nino uh, uh, usually brings the opposite. Um, but what we're really seeing since, uh, really since 1980 is a diverging, um, uh, a widening range. And so while, you know, some people talk about global warming um, and overall, yes, we are seeing a warming trend, but we're also seeing uh, these very strange occurrences of a, winters with a deep freeze, uh, even colder than we've experienced um, um, uh, many years ago. Uh, these are going to have impacts. Um, and a prime example of that is um, what, what's been coined the, the, the polar vortex, right? So the jet stream, which used to contain extreme uh, cold near the poles, um, now that, that, that mechanism is in flux and it's allowing that Arctic air to descend down to the uh, southern, southern Canada and northern United States. So the reason why I talked about, and thanks to Tom for introducing um, the tribe's action on, on removing the Hogansburg Dam on the St. Regis River. Uh, this was the first impassable uh, barrier on the St. Regis River, which meets up with the St. Lawrence. Um, but you know, for, for some people um, who use, who convey meaning through stories, um, you know, and this can have uh, positive and negative effects. Um, in this particular instance, there are some in our community who believe with all their being that the Hogansburg Dam prevented ice jams. And 
coming from a background in, in working with dams, and in fact, I sit on the United States section of the board of the most Saunders Dam, um, we know that this doesn't really have the capacity to mitigate or control ice jams. Um, but nevertheless, some people saw this concrete structure as providing this sort of benefit. And so there was a little bit of, of controversy in, within our community about um, what would be the impact of removing this dam. So this is from 2016. Um, we knew that from our, from our studies that um, the Hogansburg Dam didn't prevent ice jams, um, but we needed a way to uh, further explain to, uh, why that was the case. And uh, unfortunately, two years after the dam was removed, we had a major ice jam. So this is from 2018. Um, and um, upstream of the dam, this is what the what the environment looked like. So the river is actually flowing from from right to left, uh, flows in that direction. And this is uh, above the, the former impoundment of the dam. Um, but what you'll notice here is this is a very low lying area within the within the river, um, and actually. The, the, the land in the background uh, temporarily became an island. Um, and one, one of the things that we discovered with our, stu when our studies is that this low-lying area, that um, that was part of the natural floodplain for this river. Um, so we actually partnered with Clarkson University um, with two professors, uh, one professor, Dr. Hong Tao Shen and Fen Bing Wang. And uh, they did an analysis of, of ice jams within the, within the St. Regis River, both pre and post removal. We had a lot of data um, and about the, about the uh, bathymetry and also um, about the, the land itself. And they, they worked really hard at putting these models together that evaluated this numerical model that looked at um, how ice jams form. And uh, this is the type of work that they do around, around the world. And the results were, lo and behold, that there was a modest benefit of the existence of the Hogansburg Dam um, during low flow situations, so 850 cubic feet per second. And you'll see the red circle on the right, so that's the post-dam condition. You see a slightly more accumulation of, of ice material and ice debris. Unfortunately, um, this modest benefit goes away as soon as flows start to increase. So think of the spring freshet. So think of the, uh, anytime we have the sudden influx of warm weather, um, all of the snowpack within the watershed melts. And if there's ice and high flow, that's a combination for an ice jam. Um, you really need those two things to have an ice jam. So uh, ice with low flow doesn't really happen. But if we look at one of the higher flow scenarios, um, with the dam in place on the left and with the dam removed uh, on the right, uh, they're virtually identical, and there may be more flood inundation with the dam in place, but it's they're approximately about the same. And it just goes to show that sometimes we, you know, we use stories to convey meaning, but they can um, they can downplay the reality. They they could be used to, um, and sometimes we could use them to um, reinforce complacency, right? And so, I think this sort of closes the book on that on that question about the effect of the dam um, and its removal, but now is the hard part, right? Because we still have, if you look at these impacts, we still have a lot of vulnerability that needs to be addressed. And there's a number of ways to do that. Um, a lot of my experience with the, uh, on the Moses Saunders Dam on the board has, has taught me a lot about uh, coastal resilience and floodplain management, um, but these are skills that we need to bring home uh, and we need to address uh, at the local level. If we take a broader look, step back and, and look at, uh, there's the island that I mentioned in the previous slide, um, we need to start thinking um, more proactively about what coastal resilience means for us as a tribal community. And while the bulk of my talk is, is sort of um, focused on residential impacts, there are certainly some environmental endpoints that we need to be considering as well. And if this is the natural floodplain for the St. Regis River, um, that is prime location for certain types of restoration projects. And that could also be prime habitat for a lot of species that are of uh, significance, hunting and fishing, um, and particularly waterfowl. So, you know, these are things that are, are, are heavy on our minds and we're trying to think about um, climate change in, in local terms and through a local lens and thinking about how we can um, 
continue to adapt, you know, because we kind of, just like uh, Michael's slide about the Gaswenta and the two ways of life, you know, um, you know, we are we are a modernized society and we are modern people and we have critical infrastructure um, and we have to um, use the best of both worlds uh, so that we can continue to grow, live and thrive. Um, and, you know, that's 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 where the work really is in the, for the future. And uh, and also um, when we're doing restoration projects in, in the environment, we also need to con consider what the impacts will be of these extreme weather events and extreme weather patterns. So that's something that needs to be in, in incorporated into our, our into our thinking when we're talking about uh, our, our natural infrastructure. So thank you. Our last speaker is uh, Nikki Hilton Patterson. She's director of the Adirondack Diversity Initiative, uh, a new program just come to the North Country and and welcome Nikki. I've I've known about you for several months, but it's nice to finally see you in person. Um, I'd like to thank um, Blake and, and Titson and um, just as with all the other mother readers, just thank everyone for especially the indigenous people and recognize that we are on traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee and um, Akwesasne region. All right, so just a little bit of background. I am probably, I am the only non-scientist on this panel, okay? So when, um, when I was not able to make the panel I was supposed to be on, um, <laughs> I was asked if I could join this. And I grappled with um, um, understanding how I could talk about the St. Lawrence um, River watershed, which I had never thought about before, ever, ever, ever. And so, but I also know that um, environmental justice and um, um, transformational justice, particularly racial justice that we're speaking about right now are inextricably linked. And so let me give a little bit about my background. I am, my background is all over the place, but mostly in um, transformational justice. So I went to, I have uh, my first master's was in psychology, my second Pan-African studies, and then my PhD in um, women and gender studies with a focus on um, black queer liberation theory. Um, but I was born in Jamaica and then I went to high school in Norway. But my, so my experiences with, um, indigenous and first nations people because my my mother was Sami and I basically grew up in um, Tromsø which is very 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 north of, you know, of anything close to a big city on a on a tiny island um, where if you know the icebreaker didn't work we didn't go to school and so um, and um, and so that is my was my always been my relationship to um, indigeneity um, pre-colonial indigeneity um, and so um, when I got here, and also my father was Rastafarian, and so a very traditional Rastafarian, which meant that we, um, we were raised with um, two principles, shared humanity and our um, relationship as stewards to the earth, okay? Because um, of how the Rastafarian community and, and particularly Nyabingi Rastafarian community um, thinks about um, that the earth is all we have. There's no heaven. So we must take care of it. And so because of that, I lived in a commune until I was 10 making my own deodorant and toothpaste and all of those wonderful things, um, thinking about um, you must not leave any footprint. This is all you have, right? And, um, and so this is how I come to my position. And um, when I decided to, after my graduate work, um, and I was, I, I was living in the Bronx, my family lives in the Bronx. Right, so um, I was desperate to leave New York City. There's nothing about New York City that that is intriguing for a Jamaican Norwegian at all. Nothing, yeah. And, and so I, um, the opportunity came up in the Adirondacks, and I had been working. I'd worked in. Um, I don't know if you people know the Elmira in the Twin Tiers, and I fell in love with the Finger Lakes, right? And I felt that okay, I wanted to try this position, and I did. And I'm here and um, I'm thinking about how, as I said before, I started thinking about how incommensurate my position on this panel was with everybody else's because you're very scientific and you have lots of things on your slide. I went ahead and made a movie. But I was also thinking about um, my very, very, uh, both personal, professional and political background in decolonization. 
right? This is basically how I've been raised and, and how I live my life. Um, to grapple with how colonialism and coloniality is reproduced in everything we do, right? And here I am sitting with scientists and I was thinking, y'all are using some real colonial language. <laughs> and I was taking all these notes and looking at what you're talking about as, you know, um, pristine and natural and a return to and public access and citizen service. And I, I'm, I'm understanding and grappling with um, the use of those terms within the context of what you're speaking about and how mobilizing these terms, um, especially when you center the, the indigenous people's lived, lived experiences, um, we can mitigate the effects of human induced climate crisis and all of these things, right? But how my presentation wants to think about how in grappling with this information with um, offering strategies in doing the research, we are reproducing colonial tropes, colonial languages, and colonial ideas about race, class, gender, sexuality, citizenship, and belonging, okay? And so because I am the, the director for the Adirondack Diversity Initiative, my area pr primarily focuses on the Adirondack Park in North Country. White, 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 white. And if nothing, I am still living and grappling with how whiteness um, is centered in my life and how I navigate that and how whiteness is centered to displace um, indigenous ways of being. Okay, so I wanna start now, my film. Tell me what you can see, please. It's working. All right, yay. So um, of course, I, before I came on, I said I made a mistake. It's supposed to be deco decolonizing environmentalism. And I will speed this up because I think I'm the last one and I talk a lot, okay? So here's the, the wonderful little film I made with um, a lot of co-opted and, and borrowed footage. I don't have anything of my own. So let's talk about the Adirondack Diversity Initiative for which I am um, the director. Now I am the youngest in the group in terms of the region. I've only been here, I got here on December 3rd. Right? So I've put everybody out in terms of living and experiencing the Adirondacks. Um, but I am the director and um, I work along with a, a volunteer team of 15 persons, um, most of whom are, are um, leaders of some agencies. So the Adirondack Foundation, Adirondack Council, um, we have representatives from the Adirondack Park Association. And, and a lot of the agencies um, who are represented um, as part of the core team of the Adirondack Diversity Initiative, a lot of times they defer. They, they grapple and they disagree with how to, um, with the strategies to contend with um, environmental de degradation, right? So um, I am sort of the, 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 the gatekeeper of those disagreements. But, um, so the, the mission of the Adirondack Diversity Initiative, we really exist at the, oops, sorry. I went ahead and talked to you. Yes. So at the intersection of environmental and transformational justice. And um, it's, uh, it, the, the, the agency was, the program was created in um, 2014 out of a, a diversity summit. Right, um, that involved quite a few people, and they wanted to add to the the longevity and sustainability of the park by focusing on um, diversity, inclusion, welcomeness, making the park more welcoming, and inclusive. And that was after a multiple series of um, racist um, um, and, and aggressive um, attacks um, and behaviors against um, um, Black people and people of color coming to the region. And so, and and so, the focus of the 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 Adirondack Diversity Initiative is to work towards making the Adirondack Park and North Country more equitable, inclusive, and um, a part of just communities. A big friggin' task, okay? Yes, and I'm one employee, so we'll talk about that some more. But anyway, um, moving right along. So the philosophy of um, our philosophy at ADI is um, to privilege the lived experiences of members of the community. Um, and this stems out of our belief that communities must play a central role as actors and stakeholders. Okay, um, and I often talk about, so before, um, when um, Governor Cuomo announced his Mother Nature Act, the bond, um, a few of us were called to, I was invited to, um, to discuss how this was gonna be rolled out. And so I went into the room and there were like a hundred people in the room. I wasn't invited, but my, my CEO 
the director, um, Kate Fish, who's the director of, of Adirondack North, she was invited and she invited me along. And I was um, uh, um, visibly the only person of color, black person in the room. And I heard everybody talk about it. And then I said, I turned to the commissioner, Segos, and I said, okay, so I've heard all of these things. You're talking about strategies, what people can do with the Bond Act, but how are you going to engage members of black, indigenous, and people of color communities as actors and not being acted upon, okay? You're creating these strategies to mitigate or intervene on environmental de degradation. How are you going to engage us at the onset in the creation of these programs. And so I'm sorry, the female in the group, I really liked your, your presentation because you talked about asking the indigenous people what they want, what are their interests, okay? And so that is, that is what's central to ADI. And I, I am very vocal and I keep pushing the governor and I keep pushing um, DC commission and they pay me, right? But that is my job to grapple with how you are reproducing coloniality in a way that you forget about the voices and lived experience that you are leaving out as you are creating um, strategies to mitigate um, climate crises. Okay. So um, let's start with a little bit of education. I put this up there, even though I'm surrounded by scientists and academics, I'm going to assume that um, they, our, our, our audience needs some refresher on what is colonialism, right? The policy and practices of acquiring. And so this is a dictionary definition it's more nuanced, especially um, coming out of the mouth of someone who was raised in a, um, uh, um, an extraction colonial society to begin with Jamaica. And then after, of course, um, 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 Columbus and his friends wiped out the, the indigenous peoples and then went to live with um, the colonizers in Norway. And so the, it, it's, this definition is, is far more complex when you're talking about the lived realities of, of individuals, but just to give you a refresher. Okay, what is what is a decolon what does decolonizing environmentalism mean? It means that we're asking questions of strategies, practices, um, of we're asking questions of the environmental movement, especially when um, that movement is is not contending with the way it's reproducing race, class, gender norms. Okay, and national identity norms. What is the role of settler colonial ideas that are being reproduced um, when you're talking about the environment? And what is the role of colonialism in, in, in creating what we consider to be the environment? Now, the decolon, and also how are settler colonial ideas now still being reproduced within and by the environmental movement? Now, the historical um, um, legacy of colonialism around the creation of what we know as the environment is we understand imperial in expansion, um, the constitution of, col of, of colonies, the imposition of the notion of wilderness, right? Now, this is something that we need to grapple with, the idea of who gets to decide what a wilderness is. The consequential removement and displacement of peoples. Someone, one of my uh, the, the panelists talked about how the, um, the uh, uh, First Nations people, Indigenous people are outgrowing their space, and that's because of the displacement, right? So we are made to believe that this, if, if you have no knowledge about the Adirondack Park, the state park, you would think that the park was always the way it was, right? That there were no peoples living here, there were no bodies before um, it was de designated a wilderness, before it was designated private and public lands, right? And so this is not true. This is a myth, it's rewritten history, right? And so this is what we're talking about, the colonial legacy of what constitutes the environment. Conservation laws and policies that reproduce coloniality. And I am saying, for example, designation, I just, just talked about it, what is private, what is public, and access to the high peaks and the, the, the politicization of the overuse. And that is a really big deal for us right now because we're contending with that on a, on a policy level. Um, uh, there we go, sorry. Now, if we're thinking about the contemporary um, uh, legacy of the colonial like, in the park now, I think through, at ADI, I think through representation, lived and occupied, who gets to live now, who gets to research, who gets to manage, and who gets to protect 
what we consider to be this the state Adirondack Park. Oops. Now, when you talk about um, representation, um, and I'll, I'll pick on Roost, right, which is the um, um, destination and mar marketing organization that is, is contracted with um, DEC um, and APA through APA. And if you look at a lot of their marketing materials, they, um, the park itself is marketed primarily as a white space. Okay, so you don't often see people of color or anyone who is non white or anyone who is differently abled, you don't get those representations. Now, when you're thinking about who is who lived in an occupied and I will give you an example. When I was looking for an apartment when I just got here um, uh, systemic racism um, and, um, works in, in, in a very, um, I call it benign and insidious way. And so when I was looking for an apartment, obviously um, housing is a crisis here, but it is a crisis that's been fabricated, right? It's a crisis that, that's been created starting with colonial practices of, of, of deforestation, displacement, and acquisition of land, right? And leading through um, uh, neoliberal capitalism and the ways in which um, only certain people get access to um, uh, waterfront lands, um, the, the ways in which the um, real estate um, ownership is designated so that the, 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 the market is very high, housing market is very high. So low income peoples, young people who are trying to establish themselves are not able to make home and occupy space here and forget about people of color. Because once I was starting to look for my apartment, I couldn't find anything, obviously, um, because a lot of the, the homes were zoned, the apartments were zoned for short term, right? The Airbnb. I asked, when I asked the, the, my colleagues here to look for something for me, they found a really nice apartment. When I called the lady, um, um, she had put up our advertisement. She represented herself as a white woman living in Manhattan. And I was asking her and she said, okay, send me your information. And when I sent her my representatives, the names of the of, of my references, she called the first reference and said, well, you know, I don't know if Nicole, she hadn't checked my, my, my credit score. I don't know if Nicole has the, is, is able to maintain the rent. That was her, the statement she left on the voicemail. So I wanna to talk to you about that. What would my reference know about my credit wordness worthiness to rent an apartment. But that is her assumption, even though she already knew because she had contacted the state how much I was being paid. Right? So these are some of the things that might seem um, are, 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 are the kinds of racist implicit bias that are, are, are might seem ideological, but they present material barriers to people of color moving up here regardless of their socioeconomic status. Um, Nikki, we're just a couple more minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, yeah. so let me move it along. So when you think about um, who gets to research, do research, I'm showing some of my, the people I know here at Adirondack Research Consortium. I'm, I'm saying again, it is very male, very white, very Eurocentric. No people, the people who are most impacted by um, the climate crisis, the people who would be most impacted by the, the pollution of the watershed um, are not being represented in, in, in the spaces where um, uh, the, 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 the watershed is managed. There's no representation here. Um, and finally, let me um, protect it. Now, I just mentioned the overuse of the peaks. Pick out, and I know that um, um, I reuse the word read there, I can, if I'm um, casually looking, there are very, very few um, what I would consider people of color that I can identify in this. And so there's, a, there's contention around who, who is defining overuse and who is doing the overusing, right? And is that, is, is um, when you institute limits on use of um, the peaks and, and parklands, in, institute limits, the people who are going to be disproportionately 
disproportionately impacted are those who are already disproportionately impacted by the climate crisis, right? Those with, on, on the lower economic um, end the, and, and, and people of color, um, um, black and ind indigenous and um, other people of color. All right. And then finally, um, ADI strategies for mitigating the effects of these, and they are listed in the last one. Coalition Bailing Cultural Consciousness, BIPOC Stewardships, Public Policy Programs and Recommendations. And we can talk about that later. That's it. And, and I'm actually um, going to, I'm going to jump right in with something that was crossing my mind as I listened to all of the speakers. And what I was thinking about is that the St. Lawrence is a place of borders. It's a place of environmental and ecosystem borders. Uh, and it's also a place of human imposed borders, you know, uh, essentially uh, set up spaces, crossing lines of demarcation. Um, and we're seeing those borders right now uh, along along the St. Lawrence, we're seeing um, more uh, crossings from immigration. You know, we were, I think it was, I can't, I believe it was Tony or Michael was talking about the fact that we are going to see a lot more climate migrants. Well, right now we're seeing a lot of uh, migration patterns going north to Canada uh, for a variety of reasons. These are people from South America, um, Central America. Um, we have a wide, ver we have a huge amount of, uh, of workers in our farms who are undocumented immigrants or, or in some cases on, on agricultural visas. Um, so we have all of these borders, we have all of these uh, challenging different kinds of jurisdictions. And as I think about this, it just creates an enormous challenge in terms of trying to address the kinds of things that, that we were talking about. And many of them are much larger than the actual St. Lawrence region, right? If we're thinking about climate change, if we're thinking about um, immigration or migration pressures, if we're thinking about the changing dynamics of the populace, if we're thinking about trying to address large scale environmental issues, how, what are, what are some of the ways that we start to, to, to work towards challenges that will focus on the St. Lawrence, but are actually addressing large scale, large scale systems that are global in nature, oftentimes, if not national or international. That was an easy one, right? <laughs> Stephen, I can step in for a second just to say from the perspective of the, you know, working with the communities to try and answer the questions on their concerns on the river, some of the concerns that have come up from all communities are around, for instance, the consumption guidelines for fish, for instance, for an example. And when I try to answer that question, you, as a member of the public, if you catch a fish in the river and you're trying to decide if you can eat it and you want to find information about any contaminant contaminants in it you there's a whole lot of different places because of those borders that you talk about you know are you are you in ontario then you go to the ontario guidelines and you find that guideline and you'll find that in fact if you just moved 100 meters south of that you might be in new york state and, and there's a different guideline and in fact the guidelines for these different borders that are put over this region do not match up and so it's even in those simple practical things of an environmental you know issues that we have with contaminants where it's such a complex region and i have only been here two years and when i you know when i when i go to visit um in aquasasni i'm partially crossing the canadian border but not really because i don't actually go across the u.s border and and then i need to make sure that i don't turn down a particular road because then i get into trouble and i have to go back to the border to report that i went into new york or not so um even just collaborating and working in this space is a Suddenly, I realized you'll see on the map I provided, there are no lines on there because I, you know, I, I have this vision that at some point, don't we make it so that we have enough in common that there can some, be some sort of universal principles that we work off that don't require us to do that, even if we start with fish consumption guidelines. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, a anyone else want to jump in on this? I, I think one of the things that, you know, I tried to put across and I think is really important for us to keep in mind 
is everyone who looks at, you know, thinks about the future and thinks about how people will move, how um, animals and plants will move, or their distributions will change with climate change, can see this connectivity in North America. And a lot of it passes right through our area. And yet, when we teach our kids, many of us, not all of us, but many of us in our schools, the U.S. maps stop at the St. Lawrence River. Um, the Canadian maps stop at the St. Lawrence River. We don't see the connectivity. Um, Aqua Sasne is not even acknowledged. Um, Michael Twist has a collection of maps that show the Great Lakes stopping at the start of the St. Lawrence River or the St. Lawrence River starts at the dam, the entire international section is missed. So we don't see this area, yet this area is a crossroad and a connection. And it's an important area where things meet and things can cross. Um, and I think that when we think about a climate change and a changing environment, we've got to think in that big picture, as you mentioned, Steve, and we have to think about that connectivity, how those things are connected and how we can um, help um, people understand and help um, work in our communities to keep our communities connected and to keep the environment connected. Excellent. In, in some ways, it's about representing the, the area as a region, as a, as a whole region and a, and a crossroads. It, that actually I'm going to, I'm getting a, a bunch of questions coming in. So I'm going to move questions along here. Um, my next question is uh, for any and all panelists, if you could give a piece of advice to journalists or people who are trying to assess and look at these issues, who are trying to cover these issues and inform the public, what would it be? One piece of advice only. These are easy questions. <laughs> yeah, I would say uh, uh, speak with scientists and folks in the region um, prior to having to make a demand for a question, just to establish a relationship, which I think that'd be handy. Right, so establish the relationship before you start to ask for information. Yeah, that's great. I would Nikki. suggest not leaving out the, 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 the voices and bodies who have the most at stake. Okay, so we understand and, and we can use the science all we want, but we understand that the groups of people who are disproportionately impacted um, mm -hmm. with um, um, climate change. Okay, we, we understand that the bodies that are being are most at stake most of the time are not white middle class bodies with access to, 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 to flight. Mm. Yep. Okay, we're talking about movement and migration of bodies, but they're different. There's a different rhetoric by the press when it comes to which bodies are moving. So you just talked about someone mentioned you just mentioned migration um, because of environmental degradation, right? You mentioned mm -hmm. the, the the farm workers. I worked for the U.S. State Department, the American Embassy, for seven years. So I issued a lot of those farm worker visas, and most of them are Jamaicans. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so these, when, when reporters and the press, the media are looking for, yes, the science is critical, but you need to talk to the lives that are at stake. The ones who sure. run, have no shelter and are already being pathologized as not belonging. That's great. Anyone else? I'm gonna jump, uh, cause I've got several, several other questions here. Um, uh, what role does K to 12 engagement and education play in the vision of the environmental future of the St. Lawrence watershed? I can, um, you know, I, I can jump in because there's, I think there's a lot of opportunity there, but, and my wife is, um, high school science biology teacher. Um, you know, and their, their curriculums are very constrained. So they nearly need to think creatively about how to infuse uh, local topics. And, and, you know, given with the, um, the financial um, stress that a lot of school districts are, are under, um, 
field trips are all but uh, a, a forgotten uh, possibility. And right. um, there's so many great resources locally for students to get out and have their learning experience um, more hands-on, more experiential, right? more active. Um, and it's, it's uh, I think it's tremendously underutilized and it's unfortunate. I mean, we have so many, so many resources that are so close. People would, people should, I'm, I'm surprised more people aren't coming here, but uh, you know, I think that that's, that's something that really needs to be uh, encouraged and supported either with uh, uh, funding or um, looking at resources that are, are available across the region. Yeah. Can ahead, I step Lee. into? Yeah, of I just course. want to say I feel like this is probably yeah one of the most important things for how we change uh, or how we get more true engagement all the way through. You know, if you can get real engagement when in the education system, then people come through the system far more aware. Um, you know, all the things that Nikki is bringing up as well. There's so much language and. Um, there's so much hidden that's not being taught in the school education system and environmental issues are linked, as she was pointing out, to so many of the social constructs and colonialism and everything that comes through the school system. And I think if we can start to um, bring in environmental justice into the education system, imagine if we have everyone coming out of schools who are well informed and how much less challenging it will be then to get that engagement, like at the moment with a project like we're trying to run where we we're trying to get engagement at all levels, but imagine if all all the kids were coming out of schools already fired up with the injustices that have been done and the issues that we have. I think we'd have so many more bright ideas to help come up, up with the solutions for the future. And you know, these are the future generations. It would be great to have their voices heard, but they need to have all the information to be able to have a um, an opinion that can you know work with the situation. So I just wanted to say I think it's very important. Thank you very much for the question to the person who asked. Great. I'm sorry, I just want to say, so we, um, a part of the, the description was actions to mitigate defects. ADI has a bi-directional um, exchange, and we had arranged before COVID to bring 55 students from K-12, from the Bennington School Elementary, Middle School, um, Pablo Cabral's, and um, DeWitt Clinton High School here from starting from June 29th all the way through to the last week before. 55 students, they'd already start their engagement with um, the Wild Center, um, yeah. um, um, save the Adirondack and a couple of other, other many, many other. The DEC ha was funding this. They were going to come. They were staying at the Eagle Island Camp, um, oh, cool. North Country, um, and um, Paul Smith's College. The high school students engaged sure. in deep, sustained environmental um, projects. Um, the one of our critical missions at ADI is to develop an entire generation of stewards that don't look anything like the people who currently live in the park, right? And there's a big, there's a big um, political economy around that, right? Because most of the money that supports the park comes from the taxpayers in New York City. Yeah. Okay, and if you're talking about migration and um, the, the, the park itself in the North Country has been um, uh, fast, vastly losing its population for the last 15 years, right? Yep. So, um, and, but the, the, and, and so the, this, the population in terms of number of New York State has been held afloat by migration, immigration into New York City, overwhelmingly black and people of color. Who are the taxpayers who support the park? Yep. Okay, so our goal is to build an entire generation of stewards and we are doing it. You're talking about actions, that is action, that's holistic, that interest. So yeah. Thank you, Nikki. That's that's great. There. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm just trying to read. Um, it, I'm going to skip the question on shellfish because I think Michael an, uh, answered it already. But I'm going to jump as St. Lawrence and Franklin counties lose population. Is there a plan to keep lower priced properties on non-native land from being overrun, overdeveloped, or exploited physically and and financially? I don't, I'm not aware of that uh, per se. Um, and I don't know, Tom, if you're aware of well, I can I can maybe address that. 
Sure, um, Michael. Yep. Um, <clears throat> one of one of the things that got me thinking about uh, uh, potential conflict with with uh, with migration um, was when I first moved here. Um, I started playing hockey with some some local folks, like from from not from the university, but from just just you know town folks. And uh, one of the conversations that uh, came across was was pretty racist. It was it was with, with respect to the Amish. And I thought, what do these people have against the Amish? You know, um, what's what's the deal here? Um, I didn't, but I didn't realize that the Amish had sort of moved to this region about a decade prior to me arriving. Or, or less actually. And they were um, aggressive against this community because they were taking up all this uh, low property land and they were living in these, you know, these, these, these broken down homes and whatnot and busted up farms. And then, but now you see that those farms have come around. These people have actually invested yeah. in, in the region. So it's changed. And so that, that made me think about, you know, what could happen in the future with new people moving into the region. If they're not aware of, of, of how we value our land, um, but the whole idea of land as, 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 an, as an institution, land ownership is, is is a very complex one, and we all live in a you know um, not in a commune, put it that way. So it's a challenge to to, to think about that kind of topic. <laughs> Tom, um, go yeah. ahead, Tom. Well, one one mechanism that that I alluded to um, that is sort of very much situated in the way that at least sort of the, the dominant culture um, legal structure for land mm -hmm. is yeah. um, conservation easements. And the reason that conservation easements are popular now is because they really put a legal restriction that goes on into the future and to future generations. So thinking about people who have concerns about farms being divided up into small properties for vacation homes, a conservation easement can keep that, that property as one integral part. If you want to conserve a wetland, one way to do it is to put a conservation easement. If you want to conserve a cemetery, an old cemetery that your family has, you can put a conservation easement or a, or a special area that is is sacred or important to your family and your community that's a way to do it and you know i think that there's traditional ways where people have uh, honored and recognized the land and conserved it across generations but um in the u.s and canada we've kind of lost that and so this is the one way that we can at least to a certain extent re um uh, have those kinds of protections that can go from generation to generation. The challenge is, is, is will our descendants respect that? And that's a matter of culture and heritage. Yeah, great point. Um, lastly, and I think this one can, was touched on in different ways by almost every everybody on the, the panel. And I wanted to come back, it, it, it touches upon my question concerning borders. Um, uh, all of us in terms of the way we relate to the land and the way we relate to the institutional structures and governance around us um, uh, are looking at crossing borders and we deal with both the US border agency and uh, the Canadian border services. Um, and uh, there's a question about how those agencies are going to interact or make more challenging or uh, uh, how they affect, I guess, our relationship to, to the watershed. Um, this comes back a little bit to, to my own question earlier, but all of you mentioned different challenges and experiences. Are there ways in which we might hope uh, or aspire to see different uh, approaches being taken by, by the border services of the two nations? And, and for Tony, um, does does Aquasasne want to see a different? I'm sure they do. Um, but what would what would a different set of governance look like? Yeah, that's um, you know that that that's a great question. And you know, I just if I could just start off with speaking from my personal experience, um, you know, I've had some 
fairly negative experiences crossing the border in my in my time. And um, once I went through the process of getting this uh, Nexus card, this trusted travel card, that seemed to open all sorts of doors for me. <laughs> Not, um, and it's 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 amazing. It's like a, I don't know. It's like a it's like a, 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 a Eagle Scout badge or something. <laughs> Now I go to the board, I don't get asked any questions, but, uh, um, but when I traveled downstate, um, either on the North way or on 81, um, you know, as soon as I leave the territory, we get pulled over and asked a million questions. And it's, yeah. it just, it just happened to me recently with a trooper. And, um, as soon as, as I said, I, I worked for tribal government. He didn't like any of the answers I had, and he was intent on searching my vehicle, you know? And so it just, it just goes to, I mean, this, that hurt, you know, that really hurt. Yeah. I mean, you know, it didn't care. It didn't matter what my role was in tribal government or what schools I went to or what education I had. He knew I had something in my car. He just had to search. Yeah. Me. You know, I think a lot of things have changed though recently things have gotten better with the uh, border crossing situation some somewhat uh you know um there is a, a new influx of employees um who are more respectful and cordial and i i had i had a i had a guy and work in the booth and he spoke to me in Kanyangeha, and he asked me where i was coming from and where i was going and 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 i thought that was that was great <laughs> that's pretty impressive yeah it was impressive and i i thank them Man, that was, you know, um, you know, but I think there's still some, you know, there's still some work to be done. Um, but I mean, just in terms of like nat natural resource management between, you know, and, uh, and unfortunately Abe's not, not here tonight, but, you know, it's really hard to come up with comprehensive plans that are trans, trans border. To cross the border. Yeah. I mean, I, we, we both gave, received federal funding um, and it's hard to collaborate. And it's hard to have plans that, uh, you know, sometimes we're speaking different languages. Um, um, our, our puzzle pieces just don't fit together and it becomes a tremendous barrier to collaboration. But, you know, we try to find ways to work uh, uh, creatively to get around those. But, um, you know, that's, that's, that's an instance where we are forced into a, a, a management paradigm um, of the federal governments. Um, and not given the flexibility that we need. And, you know, we talk about fish advisories that don't even get me started. Um, you know, I mean, fish don't know borders and they don't know jurisdictions. Yeah. And we could have six different advisories for one species of fish, you know, um, and that's incredibly frustrating. And it's not good for the public either because it makes it seem like the people who, the scientists who should be respected and have their opinions um, uh, given weight it makes it look like we don't know what we're doing, right? Right. Because so, it seems like there's six different opinions. They're they're, they're conflicting with one another. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I think that uh, I, I would I would like to see um, Abe and I be a, have be able to work more directly together, and even if it, even it came to it, share employees. That's unheard of. It's unheard of. I mean, I got a yeah. social security number. He's got a SIN number. You know. Uh, <laughs> HR would have her heads. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, it, real challenges there. Yeah. A any other comments? Uh, I, I note that we're running just a little bit late uh, and Sinjin chime in here if we have a couple more minutes just for the other panelists to chime in. Definitely. Thanks, thanks so much. So, so other comments on the, on the border issue? Um, I'd like to thank all of the panelists uh, very, very much. This is, I learned a tremendous amount and um, uh, it, it was really inspiring listening to you all. Um, and uh, we have a lot of challenges, um, but I'm uh, encouraged by the kind of spirit and, uh, and, and vision and uh, knowledge that's being taken to bear on this. So thank you all very much. Um, and thank you also to, uh, to Blake and Sinson for organizing this. Uh, it's a tremendous amount of work um, and really inspirational to see the, uh, the amount uh, that, of, of work that we've seen on this, on this panel and, the, and all the others through the month. So thank you.
thank you all. Thank you so much, Stephen, for moderating these conversations, bringing all the voices together. And again, thank you to each and every one of you for making this conversation so powerful and transformative for the entire watershed community. However, there's one question I want to pose to everyone, including Stephen, and that is one dream for the future of this region. If you're gonna say one thing that you would hope, let's say 30 to 50 years from now, what would that dream be for this region here? And I, I will start with Stephen. Wow, uh, that, well, I, I do a lot of work on polarization. And what I would love to see in this region is, um, is citizens of all nations uh, in this region working harder to understand each other and understand their relationship to the land uh, that we all live on. Um, so so that, would be the, that would be the thing that I would like to see the most um, around here. There's a lot of that. There's... Uh, a lot of the stereotypes about regionality and 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 rural areas sometimes they're real and but there's there's a lot of ways in which those stereotypes are broken and i've been here now for 10 years and uh in many ways being in the north country and around the saint lawrence um has has been uh, more inspiring than sometimes the big city life that i left behind in boston uh, which had its own challenges so so I'm inspired by this area, uh, but that would be the, the dream that I would have. Thank, thank you. And now we're gonna go around, it's hard to go around in a circle now, but we'll pass on to the next person in our screen that we see, so Lee. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I feel like some of the things we touched on come back for this question. Um, if things could be done in more of a collective nature, so you know, thinking about collective impact, um, having, um, consensus around issues and then that recognition, like I was talking about in the project we're trying to do where everything's connected and we are part of this environment and not somehow, you know, overseeing it, that we recognize that and that the way forward is more where we lose those boundaries and it's um, something that's done together as a collective and people recognizing their position. Um, yeah, it'd be exciting to see, but I have never seen such a complex area. So I guess that's a really big challenge, you know, so many, um, jurisdictions, jurisdictions over the area. But yeah, that would be my dream for it. If I came back in 50 years and, and we had more, as I was saying, like from an indigenous perspective, embracing those environmental philosophies and seeing the progress we could make using that, that would be great. Thank you, thank you. Tony. Um, I guess I, I'd like to see a little less of a social media driven approach to, to enjoying nature. Um, you know, we don't need to be thrill seekers and adventure seekers. We could find uh, beautiful places to enjoy, um, even in mundane places, you know. Um, you don't need to be on a high peak to experience nature. Um, yep. You don't need to be on the edge of a waterfall. Um, there are lots of places close by, and many of these areas are beautiful in their own way and underappreciated. And I think if we start to look at uh, enjoying resources, through a broader, through a more of a wide angle lens, um, I think we'd be more likely to uh, fight for their protection. That's great. Beautiful, thank you, thank you. Michael. Um, interesting question. Uh, I'd like to see that United Nations Sustainable Development Goal satisfied, number 16. So uh, you know, justice, um, strong institutions and peace. And I think when we have a, a clean environment where everyone um, values the environment and is able to value each other and their perspectives, then I think that it will engender peace. Thank you, Michael. Nikki. Lord have mercy. Yes, it's getting late and the English is going. So you either go and take some Jamaican patois or some Norwegian. But, um, 30 years, damn, I can't even think past November. Um, what would transformational justice look like? We are, um, the bodies and the lives that neoliberal capitalism depends on for survival are represented equitably. 
in this space. That's what I want to see in 30 years. Thank you, Nikki. And then last but not least, Tom, you can finish off the night for us. What, what I, would, I would love to see and hope to see and dream to see is that we stop looking at things as borders in New York and Ontario, Aquasasne, but we see ourselves in a common landscape, in a common watershed. So we start thinking about and understanding and, and thinking about our challenges as an integral region, the St. Lawrence River Valley and the watershed around it. And we start to think about ourselves as a part of this larger community and larger landscape than thinking of ourselves in the little sort of governmental slots in which we find ourselves. Beautiful, thank you so much, Nihuan. Thank you to everyone for contributing your voices, your visions and your dreams for the future. And also we would like to thank the audience for participating tonight, asking questions and uh, listening to these amazing panels. And now looking towards the future of the summit, we have one more event, which is happening this Friday. It's happening at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And it will be the concluding address film screening in which we bring all of these issues to a wide global scale. So we'll be looking at the watershed, kind of following on with the vision that Tom was looking at to include all the actors from the watershed and look at this region, quote unquote, holistically. Now, we want to jump to other watersheds and bring voices from other watersheds. So in the concluding event, we'll have people from the Antigua watershed and Totonac, Nahua territory in Veracruz, Mexico, who will be joining us to tell us about their struggles and will be trying, they want to hear from us as well. They want to know how they can work together to collaborate across watersheds, across regions. So that's waiting for you all on Friday. And now, without further ado, we want to also hear from you from you, the audience that has waited, it's 8.08, 8.09 Eastern Standard Time. So all of the audience is still there. If you want to contribute, we're gonna share a link right now. So if you want to share your visions for the watershed, we'll be sharing this link, please go there, investigate, analyze yourselves and ask questions or answer them. So thank you. Thank you to everybody. Have an amazing night.